gonna tell you a story. Back in 1992, I was a pastor and a worship leader. I developed a problem in my throat. I felt like I had a marble in there. It turned out to be a contact ulcer. Went to the doctor and ended up having laser surgery for it. Uh, the surgery removed the ulcer, but did something else. We don't know what. And uh, for about a year, I pursued the medical uh, field, did vocal therapy, and there was a lot of mystery about it. We couldn't figure out why the original injury happened. We had no idea why the surgery went bad. There were no answers about what went wrong. But I had pain from the day the surgery happened, and I've had chronic pain now for these 22 years. Vocal therapy wasn't helping, so at the end of a year of that, I said to my wife, Honey, it just seems to me there's so much mystery surrounding this thing. It seems to me it's more than just a natural thing that has happened. I think there's something spiritual going on here. And I said to her, God got Joseph into prison. God got Joseph out of prison. If you're okay with it, I would like to go with God from now on. I was pastoring at the time, and uh, my pain levels were increasing. My strength was decreasing, and I was reading the writing on the wall. It's over. And I'm in such distress because I don't have a theology for something like this. How can you be giving yourself fully to the Lord, walking in obedience, being a fruitful in ministry, and take a hit on something that's taking you out of everything God's called you to? I mean, my theology says that giftings and callings of God are irrevocable. And so I'm in the crisis of my life. Coming into 1994, it's two years after the injury, and I'm in so much pain, every word hurts, and I'm trying to be faithful as a pastor, and I'm in such distress, I cannot go on any longer. I'm just saying, Lord, just let me quit, let me resign and crawl into a hole somewhere, and God will not let me resign. What do you do when you can't quit? The elders of our church were gracious to me, and they extended to me a six-month sabbatical. I called the summer of 94, the summer from hell. It was horrible, because now they are paying me to figure this thing out, to work it out with God, and to somehow come to some kind of resolution. And so I'm, I'm just, I'm a wreck. Our church had three services at the time, and I would bring my family to the Saturday night service to get it over with so that I wouldn't have to go on Sunday. I remember this one weekend, we came to church Saturday, got up Sunday morning, got in my reading chair, got my Bible out, and I've got such a cloud of oppression over my mind, I can hardly breathe, and I'm desperate for a word from God. Because back in that season, the only thing that would strengthen and help my soul would be a word from God. As Ephesians 1.17 speaks about the spirit of wisdom and revelation, when the spirit of revelation rests on the word and something comes off the pages that is life-giving, that's my only source of sanity in this season. And so I'm in my reading chair, I've got my Bible, and I'm like, please, 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 I am desperate for a living word from Christ. Nothing is moving. I tried praying in the Spirit. Let's see if we can get the river of God to flow a little bit. Dust bowl. After about three hours of trying to get something moving in the Spirit, I literally threw my Bible on the floor. I said, that is it. If I'm going to hurt this bad, me, 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 navel 
physician, self-centered, myopic, my little world of pain. I hate this. If I'm going to hurt this bad, my kids are having fun today. I'm taking them to a baseball game. Now you have to understand something about the way I was raised. I was raised in a good Christian home where you honor the Lord's day. You don't go to baseball games on the Lord's day. So I've never been to a baseball game on the Lord's day. In fact, I've never been to a baseball game at all. But I am in so much pain right now that I don't care about the rules. I grab my kids. I've got three kids, Joel, Katie, Michael. I grabbed a couple neighborhood kids, threw them into my minivan. My wife didn't want to go with me, so it's just me and the five kids. Off we go to watch the Rochester Red Wings AAA ball team. But I'm like a first timer in church. Where do you park? How do you get in? Where do you pay? Where are the bathrooms? But I'm trying to be cool, and so I'm like, come on kids, here we go. And we finally find our way into the stadium. They got their hats, they got their baseball gloves, and I'm in an ornery mood. I'm like, everybody gets Coke. Everybody gets popcorn. Everybody gets a hot dog. And so my kids are sitting there in the stands. It's a mid-August day, summer of 94, 75 degrees, not a cloud in the sky. Baseball in America. Katie is sitting next to me, and then the four boys. And I'm sitting there, and the cloud has not moved an inch. I am absolutely miserable. And I start having this conversation. I don't know if it's with God or myself, but I start having this inner conversation that starts like this. Do you even understand where I'm at? They are paying me to come after you right now. I am coming after you with everything I know, everything I've got, and I cannot shake this cloud of oppression over my mind. God, this thing is not working for me. Am I losing my mind? Do you even understand where I'm at? And then it kind of turned and became like this. What have I done? I must have done something to get you really angry at me because you're taking away from me everything I've ever prepared for, everything I've ever functioned in, everything I've ever been called to, everything I've ever been fruitful in. You're taking it all away from me. What did I do? to get you this angry. I swear, when you're in that kind of a tender place emotionally, you have a demon parked on your shoulder because I've got this megaphone in my ear that is just yelling at me, abandoned, forsaken, it's over. Wake up and smell the coffee. God's finished with you. You're a has been. I mean, I'm hearing all this stuff in my ear, and every symptom in my body is telling me that's the truth. But did I hear another voice? No, 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 no. This is the voice. This is the voice of reason. This voice is so loud. But did I hear another voice whispering? I am with you. I am for you. I've chosen you. It's not over. This is going somewhere. And I'm sitting in the ball game, torn between the two voices, desperately wanting to believe that I am hearing the still, small voice of the Spirit. But this other voice is so loud, so compelling, so real. And as I'm sitting in the ball game, this crazy idea goes through my brain, and I am like, no, I am not asking God if I can catch a baseball as a sign that this is his still small voice.
grace that he loves me, that he's with me, that he's chosen me. I am not asking God for a baseball because, like I said, I was raised too well for that. My parents put it into me from my youth. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. You do not do that kind of stuff with God. And so I am not asking God for a baseball. Stop it. And then it kind of changed a little bit and became like this. I wonder if God would let me catch a baseball as a sign that I am hearing his still small voice. He is with me. He's closer than ever. He loves me. He's for me. And I'm just like, this is a bad way to think. And I'm trying to shut the stupid thing off. And I cannot shut this idea off in my head. And my analytical side kicks in and I start calculating my chances. I've never been in a game like this before. What are my chances of catching a baseball? So I'm, you know, pi r squared on the field. I'm, I'm, I'm counting how many people are in the stands. I'm, I'm counting how many balls are being caught. They're not catching baseballs. And besides that, we're under this overhang. There's a set of bleachers above us. A ball couldn't even get here if it wanted to. Stop this. Three quarters of the way through the game, this guy hits a fly ball with one motion. Hundreds of people rise to their feet. Baseball gloves come out of nowhere. I've never seen so many baseball gloves in all my life. Everybody's on their feet reaching for the sky, and I'm on my feet with the rest of the fools. Here comes the ball, obviously not coming my direction. It comes like this. It's a cross beam at the base of the overhang, careens off it at this bizarre angle, and comes down straight at me. It hit me in my hands, bounced off my chest, and landed in my daughter Katie's lap. There was an old codger sitting in front of me. He turns around and he says to me, I've been coming to this field every week for 25 years. I have never caught a baseball. Katie goes, I got a baseball. I can't talk to her because of this, but I'm looking at her and thinking, that ain't your baseball. That's my baseball. I took that ball and I just held it in my hand and I sat in the stands and he gave me a baseball. I don't know if you have room in your theology for this, but I'm telling you, God gave me a baseball on a Sunday afternoon. And I don't know if my interpretation